Hi, Kara, thank you for chatting with me today. So my name is Beatrice Campi, and I'm the head of the Islamic and Indian Art Department here at Chiswick Auctions. Uh, no longer working from home, working <laughs> from the main site. Yes. Um, and together with me as members of the AAL, Asian Art London, we have also my colleague Lazarus Halstead that runs the Chinese and uh, Japanese art department. And then we also have Janet Raddy, our uh, specialist for modern, contemporary, Middle Eastern and African art. So it's three of us. I've started um, here in 2018. The department did not exist when I joined, actually. I used to work at um, Christie's. I'd spent three and a half years there and I was literally poached, shall we say, uh, from Chiswick Auctions as they felt that there was a niche in the market that, um, you know, ought to be filled and they offered me the position and I never looked back since. So it's been almost like four years. Well, congratulations. Yeah, sounds great. Um, you have a busy schedule this summer, don't you? Or this this year, I guess, with all your forthcoming sales. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, because there is no joy in the weather out there, we decided that we we're going to bring all the heat and the color of the Indian and Islamic cultures to London with two very exciting sales. Um, on the 16th of July, we're going to start our sales cycle with the Dexter collection of Islamic and Indian paintings. Uh, and that starts at 12 p.m. And at 2 p.m. on the same day, we're going to have the regular Islamic and Indian art sales where there's going to be like a great variety of different items, you know, all sorts of medias, everything from the 7th all the way to the 20th century. Wow. OK, this I mean, your, your Dexter collection sounds like the big one, if you can tell us a bit more about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the uh, Anthony Dexter collection was a very, I mean, it was offered part of it. So that's why it's called part two. Part of it, 20 lots were offered in our April sale uh, with incredible results. Everything like either went over the high estimate or reached the high estimate, which was very exciting. Um, and uh, the whole corpus of the collection uh, belonged to this gentleman called Anthony Dexter. He's still very much alive and kicking. Um, he is an English art collector and dealer and interior decorator. And he was based in uh, the Midlands, sort of like Leicester in England. Um, he he's this very whimsical character. I'm sure that a lot of my fellow colleagues that deal with individual collectors will agree with me. I, he's very whimsical. He has like this like passion for foreign cultures, and but he looks very British at the same time. So it's this wonderful mixture of things. Um, and I read a quote um, that of him and his collection. So he basically said, I simply bought what I fancied and remained just a one man band with a liking for the unusual. And it's really true that this passion for whimsical, unusual, foreign, exotic things has ignited his collectorship since day one. Uh, when he was 18, he started running his own antique shop and secondhand shop in Leicester. And by the age of 20, he bought his very first Ushak carpet for the price of 25 pounds. Can wow. you believe that? I, I loved stories like that. Yeah. Um, and yes, he just felt that, you know, he had collected for over 30 years Indian paintings and he just wanted to pass them on to, to the next art custodians, as, the, as he calls them. He calls the next generation of collectors art custodians because he realizes that we're only here for a limited period of time. Um, and I'll just close with a beautiful quote that um, he gave me is like, for the last 30 years, to say it in my own words, this world of Islamic and Indian art has been an entire lifetime trip. Wow. So I can only hope that the people that are going to buy these paintings are going to feel connected to the collector and will carry on, will lead the way for the next generation of collectors in Indian paintings. Definitely. Yeah, thanks. Um, you've got a couple of your favorite lots with you right now, right? I do, I do actually. So we have uh, some very interesting ones. Um, for instance, we have this lovely painting mm. uh, that is a standing prince with the parrot, such a typical thing to have in Indian art. Um, and what is very interesting is that, I don't know if you can see it, but the whole frame mm. has lovely inlays of carnelian marbles and colored hearthstones set in ivory. So this oh. is like very typical, like Pietra Dura inlays in the Taj Mahal, for instance, is a very typical Indian technique. And that's why I really liked it. Um, 
we also have a very interesting selection of portraits. Anthony Dexter loved Indian portraits. Um, and for instance, this lovely gentleman over here that you can see is the Maharaj of Gwalior. Um, it's what is really special about this lot, lot 85. We don't have that many illustrations and portraits of the Maharajas of Gwaliors, but the one we have show quite a consistent style. So very often they were having like heaping and piling effect with either precious stones or like some insect uh, wings, like for instance, beetle wings. So there's a very tactile element to Gwalior paintings and portraits of Maharajas. But this is my favorite one, and I'm going to talk about lot 59 particularly with you today. So I'll try and get it closer so you can sort of see it better, probably. And immediately you can spot that the scene is a ritual scene. We can see a lovely nobleman sitting down. I'm not sure if you can see very closely, but there is a fireplace just next to him, like sort of like a brazier for ritual fire. Mm -hmm. And he's reading from a booklet. And if you look at it with a magnifying glass, it's extraordinary. The booklet actually has inscriptions in the Vanagari. So it's not just like scribbles. It wow. actually has proper inscriptions. Um, he is followed, of course, by... The, the, his assistants and attendants, all of male gender, as you can tell. And opposite him, there are two ladies seated next to him um, with a very interesting headdress. Behind them, there is the whole group of women from the Zanan, from the women's quarter, basically, in the, in the Mughal palaces. Um, the reason why I love this painting is there is so many details, it's so layered. It's like a Victoria sponge cake. That's how, that's how I like to see it. But of course, at first you say, oh, it's just like a ritual scene. And then you start looking at the gentlemen and they're very, very Hindu in a way. You know, they are reciting probably hymns from the, from the Vedas. Um, they wear like typical traditional clothing, uh, almost very like Mughal in style and inspiration. And there is a beautiful symmetry in the scene, you know, the partition between the male group, the female group. There is an element of geometry and an understanding of volume, which are very much in the tradition of, of Mughal painting. But then you start noticing little details, such as, for instance, the headdress of the ladies. And then you start thinking, hmm, that doesn't look very Indian. And actually you have there the clash in front of your eyes because the ladies that are behind the main female protagonists all wear typical Indian um, dupattas and cholis, which are typical Indian garments. While instead these ladies are wearing very long tunics, which as probably you can imagine, they're not ideal in the great humid heat of India and quite elaborate headdresses with very pointy tops. So I've done a bit of research on this specific painting and um, I reached the conclusion that the ladies are probably not of Indian origin, at least their headdresses definitely are not of, of Indian um, origin and tradition, but instead they could well be of Central Asian origin because those two headdresses are very similar to bridal headdresses used in Central Asian, specifically in Uzbekistan, like uh, the Tubeteka, and the uh, Kyrgyz uh, typical bridal outfit called the Shokulo, that has like a very, um, sort of, it has like a band at the top and it's quite structured, as you can see over here. This led to the suggestion that most probably this is an interracial marriage, shall we call it, so between an Indian nobleman and Central Asian brides. Um, and the presence of the fire is very interesting because once again, it gives us the idea that the, the hymn, the ritual that is being officiated here is in line with Indian traditions, with Hinduism, because of course the, the fire is a, a quintessential element during wedding processions and wedding rituals, according to the Vedic tradition. In particular, there is this part of the um, Indian wedding ceremony called Saptapadi. Saptapadi means seven steps in which the bride and the groom knot their um, dupattas, their shawls, 
And then they walk together for seven times around the fire, making auspicious wishes and promises to each other. So I think that this is what we're looking at right now, but interracial marriage. So between Central Asian brides and an Indian man. Yeah, it must be one of the best parts of the job is the research, I guess, isn't it? Oh, I love it. If it was up to me, I would spend like hours and hours researching because it's it's so fantastic to take the time. Of course, working in an auction world, you know, you have very specific deadlines. So you always like running and it always feels a bit mice on wheels sometimes. But it's wonderful when you take the time to notice these little details, because that's how the artists communicate with us from the past. Yeah. And I have to ask, um, what's the estimate for this lot? Yes. So, so the estimate for this lot is 800 to 1,200 pounds. So okay. very affordable. Yeah. I think. I'm sure you're going to smash it. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. I'm fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Cool. Thank well, yeah, you, Claire. Thank you again so much. Speak to you soon. Not at all. Speak to you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye.